Good morning. Welcome to Jungle Jam. I am Jungle Jim. You can tell by the name on the wall. This is my riverboat expedition company, and we had a great time going down the river this week with singing and learning and crafts and science, and we're going to share a little bit of that with you. Oh, and snacks, big part of it. And we had an incredible drama that went on this week. Um, the first thing we're going to do this morning is we're going to read our, do our scripture reading, and like we did with the kids this week, we're going to ask you to stand, and you'll see the scripture on the screen, and we're just doing this one verse, and we'll all say it together. So if you're ready, to the king of the ages, immortal, invisible, the only God, be honor and glory forever and ever. Amen. I'm do the opening prayer for us this morning. God, thank you for letting us come today and learn more about you and um, be able to see what we did in VBS. Amen. Thank you, buddy. All right. As usual, one of the, the more popular stops along the way during the week was science. And we're going to invite Dr. Casey, Dr. Itchy Bumps, and Christian, I didn't see Christian. Is Christian here? Their assistant was Christian this week, so I'm going to turn it over to them. You got the Can everybody hear me okay? There I am. Okay. So, I'm Dr. Casey, and with me is Professor... Itchy Bumps. And we got the privilege of working with all the students during Tremendous Science this year. And we had a lot of fun, right? Learned a lot of really neat things this year. So, just a refresher, the Jungle Journey Vacation Bible School focused on the following Bible verse from Timothy 1.17 that says, Now to the King, eternal, immortal, invisible, to the God who alone is wise, be honor and glory forever and ever. Amen. Amen. So, in each of the group's rotations, they learned how this Bible verse applied to history as they learned how the seven seas of history affected the world. In the science rotation, Timothy 1.17 was highlighted as we conducted science experiments around each of the seven seas. So we're going to walk you through each day. So day one was titled Order and Disorder. So on science day one, there was two experiments that we conducted that focused on Genesis 1, 1 through 2, which says, In the beginning, God created the heavens and the earth, and the earth was without form and void, and darkness was upon the face of the deep. And the Spirit of God moved from the faces of the water. The two experiments on day one focused on debunking the Big Bang Theory and explained how things are not created by mistake, that there must be an intelligent creator to put order into the world and to make all things work together. Let's demonstrate this. You ready? I am, yes. Thank you. Now, he's known to throw things pretty far, so we'll work with him. Okay. So, what we're going to do is we're going to demonstrate this principle. So, Dr. Itchy Bumps is going to shake this, and I'm going to say, pyramid, 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 and he's going to drop it. Can you help me out? He did it before me. See, I told you he's a wild card. You never know what he's going to do. But, did it make a pyramid? Okay, let's try again. You ready? Now, wait on us to say pyramid, 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 okay? Okay, so you ready? One, two, three. Pyramid, pyramid, pyramid. <sighs> What's going on? No pyramid. So when we asked, did the blocks make a pyramid, of course all the students said what? No, of course it didn't. Because for that to happen, it would have to go from disorder to order. And it doesn't work like that because we have to have an intelligent creator to put work into it. So the pyramid isn't going to build on its own. It takes work. So we would have to put forth some effort into the pyramid for it to work. It's not just going to magically happen. So in the next experiment, we continued this and talked about order and disorder. So each group was given a baggie with some materials that would make the light bulb light up. And of course, we asked them, is it going to... Is it going to light up like this? And they said, what? No, because it needs order. 
So they came up with an idea and decided that it needed to be in a circuit, and we had to put all the parts in working order. So we have all these different parts. So they were very intelligent, and they said, okay, we got to put the light bulb in here, and then we have to put the battery in. But as we know, we love putting the batteries in backwards, right? And if we put the batteries in backwards, of course it's not going to work. But if we line up everything just perfectly and we touch and have a circuit, it will light up. However, at any time one of these is out of order or not connected, it doesn't work. Or if the battery is backwards, it's also not going to, it's not going to what? It's not going to work. So everything has to be in perfect order, and that takes a divine creator to make happen in our world. So these two experiments prove that things cannot happen on its own through random processes like the Big Bang Theory. It is scientifically impossible. Therefore, disorder like the Big Bang can't result in an orderly universe. Therefore, true science supports what the Bible teaches, that God is the all-powerful and all-knowing creator. So day two was called falling foliage. Now, on science day two, the experiment focused on Genesis 3, where Adam and Eve ate the fruit from the tree of good and evil, and sin entered the world. Before sin, though, Genesis 1, 29 through 30 tells us, And God said, Behold, I have given you every herb bearing seed, which is upon the face of all the earth, and bear every tree, and the which is the fruit of a tree yielding seed. To you it shall be for meat, and to every beast of the earth, and to every fowl of the air, and to everything that creepeth upon the earth, wherein there is life. I've given you every green herb for meat, and it was so. Now the students were kind of confused by that, because at the beginning, everything was a herbivore. But now we have omnivores and we have carnivores. So, at the beginning, everything was a herbivore and only ate plants. However, sin changed this, and many living things became carnivores, and the world became a dangerous place. So in the day two experiment, we discussed how the animals now had to capture their food and created traps. So there was two traps, as you can see on the screen, that the students created. At the beginning, I didn't give them very many directions. I just handed them a whole bunch of materials and said, make a trap. They were very, very clever, too. So they took their trap. Dr. Itchy Bumps, you want to help me out here? I'm throwing things. And they made them a nice little trap. What did I throw? See, I'm known to throw things too. So they got these lovely bugs, which hopefully none of you were scared of when they brought them home with them. And they created a trap. And they were very, very, very clever with their traps. At first, they were doing things like this. I can't hold anything today. Now I'm not going to. See, we're great partners. We catch each other and we put everything back together. Itchy bumps. Wow. So they had things like this, and then they were pulling it, but they weren't sure what to do with the bottle. So somebody came up with a very, I think it was Gabriel. He said, this is a fish trap. And he said, I can get my bug to go in there, and then it's trapped and it can't get out. And then Paxton added on to this, and he said, Ooh, what if we put honey in the bottom? Then that would attract them and get them in there too. So they came up with some very innovative traps as they were doing their experiments and did a wonderful job with that. Now, in the second part of the experiment, we also discussed how the fall caused some of the plants to become poisonous and carnivorous. And we specifically looked at our friend here. I don't know if anybody came home and told you about our Venus fly traps or not. They were at first a little scared of it because... They thought it bit, but it does not bite. And we were looking at how this plant in particular is considered a carnivorous plant, but it's really not. Because it gets its energy like any other plant does. It gets it from water, it gets it from the sun, and it gets it from the air. But it does do something with flies. A lot of us have the misconception that Venus flytraps eat flies. And if you zoom in a little bit, my husband's been having fun this week feeding it flies. Um, so it actually does not eat the flies. It actually sucks the nutrients out of it, and then it drops the fly back into the earth. So, but he had a lot of fun feeding it flies. And then again, it doesn't eat them. It just sucks the nutrients from it, but it gets its nutrients like any other plant. 
So it is a plant. It is not a carnivore like many of us think that it is. So on day three, our experiment was titled Skin Deep. So on Science Day 3, the experiment focused on Genesis 11 and how after the global flood, God wanted his people to keep growing their families and he commanded them to move all over the earth and fill it with people. The people disobeyed God just like Adam and Eve did in the garden. And they were working on a tall, a tall tower called the Tower of Babel. And because they disobeyed God, God confused the languages of the people. And as a result, the people scattered and moved apart because they couldn't understand each other anymore. They scattered and they filled the earth like they should have done when God originally commanded it. Now, because the groups of people went in different directions and couldn't communicate with each other, they married within the new groups that they formed. And over the years, many of the same physical characteristics were passed down from parents and their children. And that's why today we have so many different variations of what people look like. Hair color, eye color, eye shape, skin tones across the different nations, as you can tell on the map. Now, there are so many color combinations and creations. But in our bodies, God has given every human two main pigments called melanin. And one is brownish, called eumelanin, and the other is reddish, called pheomelanin. Now, depending on where you live in the world, as you can tell from the map, you need more of one pigment than you do of the other. So, for example, if you live near the equator, you would need more eumelanin and may have a darker skin tone to help you adapt to the heat in the sun. So, as Dr. Itchy Bumps is showing us, we would have a little bit more of a browner tone or even a little bit of red in there to help with the heat and with the sun. Whereas if you live closer to the North Poles, you would not need as much eumelanin because it is colder there. So your skin tone might actually be a little bit more like this, or like the lighter color up there on the screen. So we can see all the amazing combinations of these pigments in the be beautiful variety of skin shades around the world. In this experiment, we use different colors of cellophane, as Dr. Ichibumps is showing, to determine the colors that make up our skin shades and also our hair colors. They had a lot of fun trying to match up their hair colors. So for day four, which is probably one of the students' favorite experiment, was called Don't Eat Me. Miss Deborah, would you like to come volunteer with us too? Anybody else brave that wants to come volunteer? that didn't, volunteer, didn't get to do this during vacation Bible school? So on Science Day 4, the experiment focused on how God gives us our five basic senses to alert us of danger in our fallen world. So God gives us our eyes so that we can see danger. He gives us our nose so we can smell danger. He gives us our tongue. Hopefully we're not tasting poisonous things, but it alerts us to danger. We can hear danger, and we can also feel danger. So, like in day two, we discussed how sin caused living things to become carnivorous and how predators and prey came to be. Now, to aid prey, God give, has given all living things defense mechanisms to aid in their survival. So, I got my lovely volunteers here. They're so brave. Oh, I got another one? Okay. Okay. So, the first one that we did, let me kind of move some stuff around. Science is messy mm -hmm. and full of lots and lots of equipment. So the first defense mechanism was camouflage. So what we're, I'm going to do is I'm going to hand them a baggie. I'm actually just going to hold the baggie, and they're going to help me out. So for camouflage, each of the students were given a baggie with some items inside. They were asked, what's in the baggie? So they see some M&Ms, and they see some beans. Can you see two? Now, they said there were some M&Ms in there, right? How many M&Ms? Don't help them. Okay, so maybe two, one. Well, that's because some of the M&Ms are camouflaged. Now help them out. Why are they camouflaged? What, what makes this tricky? The color. There's some brown M&Ms in here. So what we did is we flattened it out on the table. Now can you tell me what you see? Let's flatten that out a little bit. Now how M many M&Ms? They were already helping you. But how many do we see now? Now we have four. One, two, three, four. So now they can actually tell there are four M&Ms in the bag. 
but if we didn't help them and if we didn't flatten it out, it would have been camouflaged and they would have never known that there was extra M&Ms in here that they may have wanted to eat. So for the next experiment, which is this is the fun part, we did something with mimicry. So the second, ex uh, the second defense mechanism we used was mimicry, which is when an animal, an insect, etc., looks like something else. Therefore, when an animal eats the wrong thing, it may be in for an unpleasant surprise and not want to eat that item or insect in the future. So I'm going to give them a couple of things to help them out because I love them. So give me just a second to set this up for them. Oh, she already said, ooh, what? Chocolate. Now, I'm going to give them something else too, but they already looked at it and they said, ooh, that looks like chocolate. Yummy, yummy, yummy. Oh, she said it smells good, so she's already using these senses, isn't she? Okay, so first thing that we ask them is, which one looks good? Well, she already said, ooh, chocolate. Both look good. She said the other one smells pretty good. Now, everyone in the group said, ooh, chocolate. And I said, okay, you ready? <laughs> They're already laughing. So they said, ooh, chocolate. Okay, now, at any time, you don't like something. Okay, you ready? You ready? You ready? So on your mark, and you got water. So on your mark, get set. <laughs> we need you to spin so they can see your face. <laughs> it's very bitter. Now, that's an example of mimicry because it looked like chocolate. It smelled like chocolate, but it absolutely does not taste like chocolate because it is 100% cacao. They're used to that really sugary, sweet chocolate. So they were, their brain automatically said, ooh, yummy, I want to eat this. And then their brain, once they put it in their mouth, said, nope, 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 nope. If you want to drink some of your water, you're more than welcome to. Lily's like, yes, please, yes, please. Okay. Now, they did not trust me anymore after the first experiment, but I made it up to them. So the next one, they said, ew, this is like slimy boogers and tadpole eggs and all sorts of gross stuff. But you ready? So you have a spoon. I promise this one's better. Do you want to try a Digi Bumps? Mm -hmm. Okay. Thank so you. let's see. They said it looked gross. They didn't want to eat it. So try that and see what you think. I promise it's better. It looked gross, but it actually was really, really good. So Miss Deborah already knows what it is. Does anybody else know what it is? It's passion fruit. It kind of tastes like an orange and a peach. What did you think? You didn't like that one either? Just, <laughs> Lily said no. She didn't like any of it. Just a taste of it. So very, very good. Okay. I'm not quite done with them yet. So, so the next defense that we used was smell. So we discussed how a skunk will use a smell defense to deter its predators. So for this defense, I gave everyone this lovely bag. She doesn't trust me. She came out and said, I don't trust. Okay, so don't do anything with the bag yet. Oh, it's got wet stuff in it. So what you're going to do, you're not going to put your hand in it, and you're going to probably want to do it really quick. So you're going to open your baggie. You're going to go... And then you're going to close it. So you ready? One, two, three. <laughs> she said, nope. So we talked about how God gives us those defenses. And would you want to eat something that smelled like that? Definitely not. Definitely not. So God gives very unique defenses to help. Now, any guesses of what this was? Miss, I know Miss Cheryl knows. It's camphor oil. It kind of smells like menthol a little bit. So it kind of reminds me of vapor rub. But when it's condensed in this bag, it's really strong. You guys did awesome. Thank you. So let's hand for our volunteers. They didn't know what they were walking into. Good job. You can keep your water if you would like to. You are more than welcome to keep your water. So give me just a second, and we will finish up. So for the last two defenses, we talked about how animals were given protection, such as quills and armor. So what this reminds us of, all those defenses, is that God gives us exactly what we need. So sin affected the world, and animals hunt and now eat each other. But God is still in control. 
So one way God keeps things in balance is by providing defense mechanisms so that animals and humans can protect themselves. While we do not have quills and armor and camouflage, etc., God does give us protection through his word. So now last can, day. Can you show us how those work? Hmm? Can you show us how those animals work? Would you like to? No, I'd like you to. He would like me to. So the porcupine uses its quills. I did talk about this because a lot of them thought that they threw their quills. They actually don't. They actually back up into. So it's more like they stab to defense. And then the armor one, they'll get in there to where the predators can't get to them. Thank you. There we go. Okay. So our last experiment that we have was on day five, and it's called Good Again. And this is one of my by far favorite experiments that we did. And they were fantastic listeners during this experiment because we were doing chemistry. So give me just a second to get all situated. Okay. So on science day five, the experiment focused on how sin entered the world and how Jesus paid the ultimate sacrifice by dying on the cross for our sins. So for this experiment, we discussed in the beginning that God's creation was perfect and there was no sin in the world but that quickly changed so all of the liquids we have up here on stage are clear but they're not going to stay clear for long clear means without sin without blemish however like we know it did not stay that way for long so dr itchy bumps is going to help me out here so everything is perfect as of right now it's clear perfect however once we take the liquid from cup number one, watch what happens. Sin has now entered the world. Our perfect world that God created for us is now blemished. So the clear liquid, as I said, shows how it was perfect at the beginning. However, Adam and Eve ate from the fruit of good and evil, and sin quickly corrupted the world. Now, there was nothing that humans could do to correct the sin. So God sent his son, Jesus, to wash away all of our sins. Now, this is the cool part you're going to want to watch very carefully. So the liquid in cup number two, as soon as Jesus came and paid for our sin, all of our sin instantly was washed away. Amen. That's right. So as you can see, the sin has disappeared. And Hebrews 10.10 10 says, our sins are washed away and we are made clean because Christ gave his own body as a gift to God. He did this once and for all times. So sin corrupted God's very good creation, but God has promised that one day he will make everything very good again at the consummation. So, Dr. Casey, you see I've got this special hat on. It's got all these colors in it. It's a good news hat. I also have these three colors on me. I think I'll, I'll just make comments about them because I cannot tell you about everything. You see, the one is uh, kind of silver. Just imagine that that is white, like my, my coat. God wants to take our sin away and make us clean. Though your sins be as scarlet, they shall be as white as snow, says the Bible. Now, the way God does that is that he sent Jesus to pay the price and he shed his blood, we just reminded of us of that, he shed his blood so that we could go to heaven. And the blue represents going to heaven. Now when I say we go to heaven, I'm not saying we just go into the blue sky. The Bible talks about heaven in three ways. And there's God's heaven, and that's where we go. We go to be with God in his heaven, not just in the blue sky. He's not just living up there somewhere in space. Whoop! So... You see, my hat also says the same kind of thing. The blood is represented by the red, and the white represents, is here by the seen in the white, and, and the blue represents heaven. Now, the only way you get there is when the blood of Jesus is applied to your life. So you have to ask God to apply his blood to your heart, to your life. And he does that by coming into you. When you call on him, please, Lord, come into my life and cleanse me. Thank you for shedding your blood for me. And now come in and cleanse me and live inside of me. And until we do that, we won't ever go to be with God in his heaven. 
We really have to call on him. And thankfully, some of our children did it this week. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you, Dr. Casey and Professor Itchy Bumps. How about give them another round of applause? After they would be in science every night, we would hear a little bit about the experiments, but the night they had the cacao, we really heard about it. Um, so next up on our river adventure is Amazon Al is going to share Bible with us. Well, we had a fantastic time this week sharing the good news of Christ with all of our children. And as we said, we went from Genesis all the way through Revelation. And I did it with two people that I couldn't have done it without. That was Miss Peggy and Miss Jessica. So if y'all would stand, I'd like to have y'all recognized because they were in their teaching Bible with us as well. And what we did this week is we went through what we call the seven C's of the Bible. And we started with creation, corruption, catastrophe, confusion, Christ, cross, and consummation. And our first stop on our journey was creation. And creation was the color green. And with that, we learned that green reminds us of God's beautiful creation. His creation was perfect. It was the best thing that you could ever imagine. And that when God created each day, all he had to do was speak, and it happened. And then we also shared with them two stories. One was a story about Dot. And Dot, what we basically did was had a, a balloon filled with little tiles that had letters on it. We held it up and popped that balloon. And when you popped it, the little tiles went everywhere. And we asked the students, we t- asked them, is there any order to this? And they're like, no, it's like chaos. So we told them that the people who believe in the Big Bang Theory, this is how they believe creation was done, just with one Big Bang and things fell everywhere. Then we went into the biblical account of creation and told them how God specifically created certain items on the first, second, third, fourth, and fifth, and sixth day. And that God, as we said, he spoke And it happened. And we also informed them that when God created, he had a specific order he created it in. He created things at the beginning in order to sustain the animals, the plants, and humans. So it was all a plan that God had started, and it stayed to perfection. Then we asked them, which story is true? And, of course, they all said the Genesis story, which is correct because... The Bible is inspired by God, and God does not lie, so the Bible is true. God can only tell the truth, and his word says that he is the creator. It was not a random bang that caused the universe to be established. And we saw that in our verse for the day, which was Genesis 1.1. In the beginning, God created the heavens and the earth. Our second C on the second day was corruption, and that color was black. And that's going to be representing sin. As I said, everything was perfect. There was no sickness, no pain, no death, no crying, just perfect. And then one decision happened that changed the world forever. And that decision was God had told Adam and Eve, you can have anything in the garden except for the fruit off of the tree of the knowledge of good and evil. And as Eve's walking around the garden... All of a sudden, she hears this, hey, Eve, over here. There was a serpent that started talking to Eve and told her, hey, eat this fruit. And Eve, being human, even though everything was perfect, she made one bad choice that changed the entire history of the world at that time. And that was she took that fruit and she ate Then she gave it to Adam and he ate. So they disobeyed God and sin entered the world. The perfect world that God had created was gone. Not only did we have sin, but we had sickness. As they said in science, the animals turned on each other. When they didn't need each other before, they were now attacking each other. It was total sin, no order, no chaos. It was all chaos. 
even though God was in control, sin had entered the world and changed the lives of us forever. When, that's when bad things and sad things started happening. The world became corrupt, full of both good and bad. And our Bible verse for that night was Psalms 14.3. They have all turned aside together. They have become per- corrupt. There is none who does good, not even one. None of us do good. We sin every day. And it's because of the beginning when the first decision was made that in, allowed sin to enter into the world. On the third day, we did two... Um, well, this is the second day. We did another color on the second day. We did blue for catastrophe. So after Adam and Eve sinned, the perfect world was gone. People started sinning, and as they populated the world, sin just became very rampant, and God was not happy with what he created. So this reminds us of the water that covered the earth when God caused the flood to happen. By this time, mankind had become so wicked that God had to judge the world. He sent a global flood, and we emphasize global flood. It wasn't a local flood. It was a worldwide flood that got rid of all people that were not on the ark. The only ones that were saved was Noah was saved with his family and some of the animals. And with the animals, we, went, we had posters that we showed them, but we went into the different you know, question. They may have they had was well how could God bring so many animals? Well, He didn't bring a beagle, a Datsun, a German Shepherd, or a whole set of dogs. He brought a kind of dog. So it was two of each kind. We even talked about the dinosaurs. How were there dinosaurs on the ark? Sure, but the dinosaurs were like a T Rex. They were small dinosaurs. So they came in by their kind, not by all the different species that they have. The species came about later after the flood was over and they spread out into the world and populated the world. So that covered day three. Then on day four, we talked about confusion. Have y'all ever been confused? I am every day. Just ask my wife. But the way we did this, we started talking about how God had commanded the people to spread out around the world. Well, what did they do? They didn't learn the lessons they had heard from Adam and Eve sinning in the flood. They did their own thing just like we do every day. They stayed in one location and they started to build a tower, which was the Tower of Babel, because they wanted to stay together and to reach the heavens. But once again, God was disappointed. And one cool thing about this lesson is Miss Deborah came in and we introduced Miss Deborah and she was talking English. And then all of a sudden, in the middle of our conversation, she started speaking, speaking Portuguese. So the kids were like, what? And then as she's speaking her Portuguese, I started speaking Mandarin, which even confused them more. And then after a few minutes of us going back and forth and the teachers talking in English, we started saying, this is what happened. They were all confused because they were given a different language. And that's how they spread out. God sent them out from the Tower of Babel, and as you saw earlier in the science, that's how we got our different people groups, our different um, skin color, eyes, and all that. But you know what? Even though everybody is scattered around the world, we're all still related. We're all still go back to Adam. We're different, but we all have um, one God that we follow, and that is Jesus Christ. And our verse for that day was Genesis 11, 9. It says, therefore, its name was called Babel, because there the Lord confused the language of all the earth. And from there, the Lord dispersed them over the face of all the earth. The next lesson we talked about was two colors in one. First color was white, which was for Christ. And we emphasized how even after the Tower of Babel, the people of that time, they kept sinning, kept sinning, would ask for forgiveness, kept sinning, and God would continuously forgive. And God had promised them that there would become, at one day, a Messiah who would come to save the world. And this is what this one referenced to. And one of the interesting things it has here is this, Christ is not the last name or his last name, but it is a, world, a word showing his special mission. 
which means Messiah. He was the one chosen, the one coming to save people from their punishment of sin. Before he came to earth, Jesus lived in heaven, and he lived there for all eternity. And then I explained to them in Revelation where it says he's the Alpha and the Omega, the beginning and the end. God was in the beginning. He was there at creation. Christ was there. Jesus was the Father. All of them were there being involved in creation. And then all the way through the Bible, all the way to the end, God is there. God is alive for eternity. And so we explained that to him as well. Adam and Eve sinned and the world became sinful and cursed. But God promised a Savior would come to rescue people and that they would live forever. So they wouldn't have to live forever with God but could have the choice to live with him for eternity in heaven. We went on to tell him a little, about, little bit about Jesus, how he was born in Bethlehem, how his ministry started. You know, he did miracles. He did healing people. He fed 5,000. And people started to notice. But even though he was doing good, there were some people that were evil and that they wanted to kill him. They wanted to get rid of this Jesus because they thought he was either teaching a false doctrine or they were afraid he was going to take over in their place. And so we know Jesus has the power over sin and he came to be our Messiah. And then the next color for that day was red for the cross. And the red reminds us of the blood that Jesus shed for us. The Bible tells us the punishment of sin is death. And then we ask them this very to the point question. We asked them, can you imagine if someone you love was put to death because of what you had done. In other words, could you imagine if you took the place of someone else who was dying? And then we went on to explain to him that's exactly what Jesus did. He loved you so much that he was willing to take your place and die on the cross. We should have been on the cross, not Jesus. But he loved us enough to die for our sins. And then after Jesus died, he rose from the dead on the third day. And it's important that we remember that you and I are still sinners. Just like Adam and Eve and the people who wouldn't get on the ark, those at the Tower of Babel, everybody disobeys God's commandments. We're not perfect. The only one perfect person is Jesus Christ. And then we reemphasized how much Jesus loved us. And that was because he died for us on the cross. And then I want to share a story with you that we shared with them and I'm just calling it the cookie story. And it was a unique story that kind of brings everything together. I want all of you to put your thinking caps on and your imaginary caps on right now. Imagine your favorite all-time cookie being put in your hand right now. Imagine that you are at your house. Your mom comes in from the grocery store and she goes, Hey, Al, I've just bought some of your favorite cookies. I'm going to put them in the cookie jar, but you're not to eat those cookies. And you're like, well, why, Mom? She goes, because I don't want you to eat those right now. So Mom goes in the kitchen, puts them in the cookie jar, comes out of the kitchen, goes into the laundry and starts washing clothes. About 30 minutes later, you're like, man, I'm really hungry. Those cookies are in the kitchen. Mom will never know. So I go into the kitchen Open the cookie jar, and guess what? My hand goes in that cookie jar and, and pulls out the Oreos. And I eat one, two Oreos. Then I go on about my business, sitting on the couch, watching TV or playing on my game. And then Mom comes down, and she goes into the kitchen. And she comes back out, and she goes, Ow, did you get any of those cookies? Uh, no, ma'am, I didn't do that. All right, so what just happened? We just sinned. We disobeyed. And then your mom looks at you and said, are you sure you didn't eat those cookies? No, ma'am. Well, there's your second lie, second sin. And then she goes, well, why are there cookie crumbs on your lips? And then you admit, yes, mom, I ate the cookies. And the mom says, all right, due to your disobedience, there has to be a punishment. And right before she gets ready to punish me, my brother comes and says, Hey, Mom, don't punish Al. I'll take his place. Punish me instead. 
That's what Jesus did for all of us. He stepped in and took the punishment that we deserved. Took it all on himself so that he would die on the cross and shed his blood so that we can be forgiven and have a right to become members of his family. Jesus bridged the gap between our sinfulness and eternal life in heaven. And we use this illustration. We told him that imagine you're on one side on one of those islands and you want to get to the other side. The water that you see there, that represents sin. Without the cross, we can't get to the other side where Jesus is at. But when he died on the cross, that cross gave us a pathway to forgiveness and to eternal life. We then went through the, um, what I call the ABCs of Christianity. The first one was, you must admit that you are a sinner. All of us are sinners. We were born into sin. Adam and Eve had it all, and then they took one bite, which changed the world. So we have to admit that we're a sinner. We have to believe in Jesus Christ. And I asked them, I said, can somebody tell me what believe means? And of course, I got a few different answers, but it, most of them were saying things like that you have to know, you have to understand. So you have to understand and believe in Jesus Christ. And we applied all of our lessons again to them as to how we believe. And we have to believe that Jesus died, he shed his blood, he rose again, and that he's in heaven today and he's coming back to see us and take us back with him. And then, I've used the word confess, but here they had receive him as your savior and receive him forever. And on that, I told them that Jesus is standing here right now with his hand wide open with a free gift. Y'all like free gifts? I do. It was a free gift called salvation. And I said, all you have to do is admit, believe, confess, and then you have this free gift that God is waiting for you to take. And our verse for that night was John 1, 12. But to all who did receive him, who believe in his name, he gave the rights to become children of God. And we told them that if you take that free gift of God, what does that verse tell us? and you believe in his name, you are now a child of God. And that's the best thing that you can ever do in your life is become a child of God. After that, before we get to consummation, one of the things that, yeah, Wednesday, it was Wednesday we did that. Wednesday was just one of those days where for me personally, I don't know anybody else with VBS, VBS, that just nothing went right. Nothing. Um, I was on the struggle bus I knew what I was going to do later on the night. And I don't know, the devil was just fighting so bad. I said, I asked the Lord, I said, Lord, get Satan out of here. I don't want him around me. What I did was I led, at this point, I led these students through um, a prayer of salvation. I asked him, I said, everybody in a serious mood, bow your heads. I want you guys... If you want God in your heart and you want this free gift of salvation, I want you to repeat a prayer after me. And I said, you can say it quietly. You can say it out loud. Every single class we had, children were saying that prayer out loud. So I knew then that the devil was defeated and God got the victory. Um, And then our last night, we talked about consummation. And consummation is like a final, the ending, how everything's come together. So like we started in Genesis, everything comes together at the end in Revelation. And we talked about a new heaven and a new earth, how things were going to be perfect again, just like they were at the beginning before Adam and Eve sinned. When we get to heaven, there's going to be no more pain, no more sorrow, no more death, no more crying. Everything is going to be perfect again and that God himself will be the light that we'll be looking at forever. And our verse for that night was Revelation 21.4. He will wipe away every tear from their eyes, and death shall be no more. Neither shall there be mourning, nor crying, nor pain anymore, for the former things have passed away. So we then explained once again to them, you know, God created a perfect world at the beginning in Genesis for everybody to enjoy. 
sin entered the world. It changed the course of the world for a while. Sin kept coming in. People kept sinning. And then Jesus sent his son, or Christ sent his son Jesus, to die on the cross to forgive us of our sins and to shed his blood for us. And then the end of the book in Revelation, we dug into a little bit of Revelation by playing a, a, like a game among the students with different things that are going to happen out of the book of Revelation. But everything, when that new heaven and new earth comes back, it's going to be perfect again. And if you've accepted Christ as your Lord and Savior, you're going to be a part of that. So just in review, our seven C's again were creation, corruption, catastrophe, confusion, Christ, cross, and consummation. And I really think that these lessons hit home with the students. Um, they were very interactive with us. They answered questions. They were involved in our activities. And I really just am thankful that I was able to have just a small part of teaching the gospel to the students. What I'd like to do now is I'd like for everyone to bow their heads. Just as I did Wednesday night, I want you to just examine your life right now. Maybe you're someone that's never asked Christ as your Lord and Savior. Maybe you have a burden on your heart that you're struggling with right now. God tells us if we lay our burdens at his feet, he'll take care of them for us. Maybe you're a Christian. Maybe you have backslid. Like I said, we all sin. Maybe we have a sin you need to confess. That's what the altar is for. So I just want you to keep your head bowed as I lead us in a word of prayer. And then after that, we'll have our invitation. And if God lays anything in your heart, if you were one of the campers or people attending VBS this week that may have made a decision for Christ, if you want to come down and talk to us about it. Or if you're here today and have, want to make a decision, we'll be down at the front. Or if you just need to come to the altar. You know, the altar's here. Let's use the altar and lay our burdens and our troubles at the feet of Jesus. All right, let's pray. Lord God, we thank you so much for this day. Thank you, Lord, for this phenomenal week of VBS, God. And Lord, we thank you so much because, Lord, we couldn't do it without you giving us the strength to do this. We thank you, Lord, for each worker. We thank you for each student that showed up. And, Lord, we thank you for the lessons of teaching the seven C's. It's an easy way to hear the Bible and to learn your gospel. Lord, I pray for those here today that are in attendance. Some of those may not even have you or know you as your Lord and Savior. Lord, if it's their will to know you and they have that desire, I ask that you just touch their heart, Lord. Let them make a decision today, Lord, before it's too late because we're not promised our next breath. Lord, if there's some here who are going through trials or burdens, Lord, the altars here, as I said, Lord, lay them at your feet, Lord. You will take care of them for us. We love you, God, and thank you so much for everything that you do. And we look forward to um, what you have in store for us the rest of the week. In the name I pray, amen. So at this time, we are going to have a song, but I want all the students to just stay in their seats and do some re as reverence here. But Pastor Sean and I are going to be down here at the, the front. And if you want to come talk to us, we will be, um, be glad to do so. Before Cheryl comes up here, she's got a presentation to make. I want to share two more things with you. The first one, I want to expand on something Al shared with you just a few minutes ago. He talked about how Wednesday night Satan jumped on him and everything didn't seem like it was going to go the way it needed to go. Five minutes before we started, we work off a script up here as we start the, um, we, we start the opening ceremony um, every night. Al literally had a... Had, um, allergies so bad he could not see the script in front of him and there's a lot of interaction between us and he took a minute and he stepped back and he prayed and quite literally God cleared those tears from his eyes and he was able to continue and that was a really cool thing I've seen that happen twice in the last two years last year Greg Dees had a, had something similar happen if you don't believe that God was at work this week just look at how much Satan knew that God was at work in this place, and he wanted to try to stop that. But Al was faithful, and he said that prayer. He talked to God, and God cleared those tears from his eyes, and I was really impressed by that. 
The other thing I want to share with you is every night we had a little competition, the boys against the girls. The boys won this year again. But what, what they did, it was more than a competition. It was, it was an offering to raise money for the Children's Hunger Fund. This week, through VBS, both boys and girls combined raised $682.93 for Children's Hunger Fund. And that represents 2000 731 meals for families, which will be presented along with the gospel of Jesus Christ. So big hand clap for them on that. Cheryl, we'll turn it over to you. Okay, so um, we just really, uh, when they say God has blessed VBS this year, um, there has been so many um, times throughout the week, before VBS began on Sunday, all the way through the end of VBS, where God has shown that he has been here and has been present. And um, one, of the, <laughs> one of the things that God has blessed us with is the amount of people that we have had that have helped us make this VBS successful. Um, and so uh, on behalf of Oakwood and Casey, if, you wanna, if you'll come up to um, Casey and I would like to thank our, our volunteers and our helpers. It's just something small. But um, if you guys could stand up, please, um, for just a moment, so we could recognize y'all. If you helped with VBS, could y'all please stand up? And I want y'all to keep in mind, not everyone that helped is here today. Some of them are also in nursery, helping with nursery. Some of them are out in the lobby um, and in our our cry room. So um, thank y'all so very much for letting God use y'all this week and for making a difference in these children's lives and in their families. So, um, so if y'all could stay standing for just a minute, we just um, wanted to walk around and give y'all one of these. Um, to the families who brought your children here and to the children who came, um, thank you so much uh, for letting us share five days with y'all and with your children. Um, they were such a blessing, and we're so glad that you came back to visit us today, um, and uh, we hope that you enjoyed seeing a little bit about what their week consisted of. So thank you very much. 